Preface to Amadis of Gaul. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobeira, translated by Robert Saudi. Preface. Amadis of Gaul was written by Vasco Lobeira, a Portuguese who was born at Porto, fought at Aljubarrota, where he was knighted upon the field of battle by King Joan of Good Memory, and died at Elvas, 1403, where he formed a morgado, and entailed an unalienable estate, which afterwards descended to the Abreus of Alcarapinha. The Spanish version, which is the oldest extant, is by Garcia Ordonez de Montalvo. Regidor of Medina del Campo. He says he has corrected it from the old originals, which were corrupted by different and bad writers, and badly composed in an ancient fashion. That he has abridged it of many superfluous words, and inserted others of a more polished and elegant style. The Comte de Tressan has claimed the work as a French production. It is doing too much honor to Vasco Lobeira, he says, to consider him as the author. The French translation by Nicolas d'Herberet was indeed made from the Castilian, but there is reason to believe that he only restored it to the literature of his own country, from which it had first been taken by the Spaniards. D'Herberet remembered certain manuscripts of Amadis in the Picard language, and these, he thought, might be the originals which Montalvo modernized. These manuscripts, says the Comte, might very easily fall into the hands of the Spaniards. Philip the Good, or Charles the Bold, might have found them when they carried their arms into Picardy. Thus, they might get into the library of Marie of Burgundy, and her son, the Archduke Philip, might carry them into Spain. The Comte, does not found his opinion entirely upon this concatenation of contingencies. He thinks he has seen a manuscript of Amadis in the Romans, or what D'Herberet calls the Picard language, among Queen Christina's collection in the Vatican. From the manifest superiority of the three first books to all the continuation, he argues that they cannot have been written in the same country and from their good taste and high tone of sentiment, he proves that they must be originally French. This is indeed French reasoning. Had the Comte de Tressan been versed in Portuguese literature, he might have found one single evidence in favor of his assumption. In the Agiologie Lusitano, tom 1, page 480, José Cardoso says that Pedro de Lobeira translated the history of Amadis de Gaulle from the French language, by the order of Infante Dom Pedro, son of King John I. He calls him Pedro, says Barbosa, that he may be wrong in everything. The first volume of the Agiologio was printed in 1652. With this single exception, the Portuguese have always ascribed the work to Vasco Lobeira and the authority of this tradition would alone outweigh all the possibilities of the French writer. It is substantiated by the work itself, and by old and unquestionable testimony. At the end of the 41st chapter, volume 1, page 220, it is said that Briolania would have given herself and her kingdom to Amadis, but he told her right loyally how he was another's. In the Spanish version, volume 72, this passage follows. But though the Infante Don Alfonso of Portugal, having pity upon this fair damsel, ordered it to be set down after another manner, that was what was his good pleasure, and not what actually was written of their loves. And they relate that history of these loves thus, though with more reason, faith is to be given to what we have before said. Briolania being restored to her kingdom, and enjoying the company of Amadis and Agrayes, persisted in her love, and seeing no way whereby she could accomplish her mortal desires, 
she spake very secretly with the damsel to whom Amadis and Galaor and Agraes had each promised a boon if she would guide Don Galaor where he could find the knight of the forest. This damsel was now returned, and to her she disclosed her mind, and besought her with many tears to advise some remedy for that strong passion. The damsel then, in pity to her lady, demanded as the performance of his promise from Amadis that he should not go out of a certain tower till he had a son or daughter by Briolania. And they say that, upon this, Amadis went into the tower, because he would not break his word, and there, because he would not consent to Briolania's desires, he remained, losing both his appetite and his sleep, till his life was in great danger. This being known in the court of King Lisuarte, his lady Oriana, that she might not lose him, sent and commanded him to grant the damsel's desire, and he, having this command, and considering that by no other means could he recover his liberty, or keep his word, took that fair queen for his lemon, and had by her a son and a daughter at one birth. But it was not so, unless Briolania, seeing how Amadis was drawing nigh to death in the tower, told the damsel to release him of his promise, if he would only remain till Don Galaor was arrived, doing thus that she might so long enjoy the sight of that fair and famous knight, whom, when she did not behold, she thought herself in great darkness. This carries with it more reason why it should be believed, because this fair queen was afterwards married to Don Galaor, as the fourth book relates. Here, then, it appears that an infante of Portugal commanded some alteration to be made in the story, because he was displeased that Briolania should love in vain. There exists a sonnet ascribed to an infante of Portugal and addressed to Vasco Lobeira, praising him as the author of Amadis and objecting to this very part of the story. It is thus printed in a work entitled Obras Inéditas dos Nossos Insignes Poetas, dadas à luz por Antônio Lourenço Caminha, Lisboa, 1791. Soneto, feito pelo senhor infante Dom Pedro, filho do senhor rei Dom João I. Outros dizem que é do senhor rei Dom Afonso IV, mas prova-se que foi do antecedente, porque o Lobeira morreu no ano de 1403. Bom Vasco de Lubeira e de Grão Sem, de Pran que vos avades bem contado, o feito de Amadis, o namorado, sem que darende por contar irem, e tanto vos aprove, e a também, que vos seredes sempre endiloado, e entre os homens, os por aumentado, que vos eram adiante, e que era bem. Mas por que vos fizeste a formosa, Briorán Ramar Endoado, Non, este cobarde, e contra Sá amaram vontade? Caiu ei grão dó da ver queixosa, por sa grão formosura e sa bondade, e or porque ao fim amor não lhe pagaram. In the reign of Joam I, says Manuel de Fari Souza, the infante Dom Pedro wrote the sonnets Bom Vasco, etc., Vim Amor, etc., in praise of Vasco Lobeira, the inventor of the books of chivalry, by that of Amadis. I know not where the second of these sonnets is to be found. Neither of them are among the Infante Dom Pedro's poems, published by José Soares da Silva at the end of his Memórias para a História del Rei Dom João I, as copied from the Cancioneiro of Rezende nor do I recollect them in that very rare and valuable collection to which I cannot now refer. But it is impossible that this sonnet should have been written by either of the princes to whom it has been ascribed. The Infante Dom Pedro was but in his eleventh year when Vasco Lobeira died, and Lobeira himself must have been a boy at the time of Afonso the Fourth's death. Montalbo, and Manuel de Faria, and the Portuguese editor, are, in this point, all in the wrong. 
if it be the composition of a royal or of a princely author, it must be King Pedro. This, however, must remain uncertain. But we may believe what Montalvo tells us, that the story had been altered in compliance with the taste of some noble Portuguese. The language of this sonnet is certainly as old as the time of Joam I. It agrees with the opinion of the person whom Montalvo calls the Infante Alfonso, and it addresses Vasco Lobeira by name as the author of Amadis of Gaul. This evidence is sufficiently decisive. It is incontrovertibly confirmed by Gomes e Anis de Zurara in his Crónica do Conde Dom Pedro de Menezes, a work written in 1463 and first published in the Coleção de Livros Inéditos de História Portuguesa, 1792. He expressly says that Vasco Lobeira wrote the book of Amadis and that the whole was his own invention. Could he have foreseen that it would have ever become a subject of controversy, his testimony could not have been more decisive. Já seja que muitos autores, cobiçosos de alargar suas obras, forneciam seus livros recontando tempos que os príncipes passavam em convites, e assim de festas e jogos e tempos alegres, de Buicinon seguia outra coisa, senão a deleitação deles mesmos, assim como são os primeiros feitos de Inglaterra, que se chamava Grã-Bretanha, e assim o livro da Madis, como quer que somente este fosse feito a prazer de um homem, que se chamava Vasco Lobeira, em tempo del rei Dom Fernando, sendo todas as coisas do dito livro fingidas do autor. Tom 2, page 422. Therefore, it can be no longer doubted that Vasco Lobeira is the author of Amadis of Gaul. The romance was written towards the close of the 14th century, if in Fernando's reign, before 1383, but certainly after Edward III had laid claim to the crown of France, and when the court of Windsor was the most splendid in Europe. This is evident from the work itself. Had it been written later, even by one generation, Montalbo could not have complained of its rude and ancient style. Barbosa says the original work was preserved in the family of the Aveiros. If this copy has escaped the earthquake, it may probably be traced from the wreck of that family, and it is greatly to be wished that the Royal Academy of Lisbon would publish it for the honor of Portuguese literature, to which that academy has already rendered such essential services, and which by other nations is little valued, only because it is little known. 2. Tressan claims for his countrymen only the three first books. In the fourth, he says, the Spanish taste begins to predominate, but the ridiculous anachronisms, which he particularizes, are all interpolated by Derberet. King Lisuarte's train of artillery his powder, his bullets, his bombs, and his culverins, are not to be found in the Spanish version. Cannons are once mentioned, as they are in Hamlet, but as in Hamlet it is a casual absurdity, the effect of carelessness, not of an ignorance which would have infected the whole work. The beginning of the fourth book is indeed very inferior in interest to what precedes it. The business and bustle of adventure are succeeded by long speeches in a needless detail of the different embassies. How much of this prolixity is to be attributed to what Montalbo calls his more polished and elegant style, it is now impossible to ascertain. Yet this prolixity has its effect. If it provokes impatience, it also heightens expectation. It is like the long elm avenues of our forefathers. We wish ourselves at the end but we know that at the end there is something great. The Comte was of opinion that the original romance concluded with the rescue of Oriana. This would have been an unsatisfactory conclusion, nor would it have completed the author's design. Amadis is not safe, and cannot be happy, while King Lisuarte is his enemy. 
the preeminence of Oriana above all her sex is not proved, till she has achieved the adventure of the forbidden chamber. The reconciliation of her husband and her father, and this triumph which proves that, as the best and fairest of women, she alone is worthy to be the wife of the best and bravest of men, must be the work of the original author, unless he left the story incomplete. But there is no reason to suspect that the work of Vasco Lobeira was not completed. That, as well as the rudeness of the language, would have been mentioned by Montalvo. He would have claimed the merit of finishing the story, as well as of polishing the style. With the celebration of the marriage, the story obviously concludes. I have ended here, and left the reader to infer that Amadis and Oriana, like the heroes of every nursery tale, lived very happy after. The chapters which follow in the Spanish are evidently added to introduce the fifth book, or what Montalvo, in something like a quack's Greek, calls the Sergus of Esplandian. It is one romance growing out of another, as clumsily as a young oyster upon the back of its parent. The episode of the Queen of Dacia has been introduced for the same purpose. This has been here retained, that if any person should hereafter continue these volumes upon the plan of the Bibliothèque des Romains, everything necessary to render the after-stories intelligible may be found in this, though this is in itself complete. The patchwork of Montalvo's imagination is in many places distinguishable. The letters upon Esplandian's breast, the most foolish fiction in the book, are his invention, for the interpretation is in the Sergas. Probably he has lengthened the period between the quarrel of Amadis and the king and their reconciliation. Oriana has no spell to preserve her charms when she wins the prize of beauty, and yet her son is at the age of manhood. It was convenient for the continuation of the history that Esplandian should be of age to follow arms when his father retired. If the faults inserted by the Spaniard, with reference to his own supplement, were weeded out, the skillful structure of the original story would not be less admirable than the variety and beauty of its incidents. The Orlando Innamorato is the only story that has ever been successfully continued. Boyardo had written but a fragment, and a fragment it was left by Berni. Montalvo had no such plea for adding his supplement to Amadis. The design was complete, and whatever he added to the finished structure could only mar its proportions. It is dangerous to attempt subjects which have been ennobled by a great master. Even the Greek tragedians were not equal to the task of dramatizing the characters of Homer. They could not bend the bow of Meonides. They teach us to despise Ajax and to dislike Ulysses, for they attribute nothing but cunning to the one and only brutal courage to the other. They caught the outline, but the finer shades and discriminating lines escaped them. In our own literature we have an illustrious instance. Who can tolerate the tale of Paradise Lost in the rhymes of Dryden's play? It is fortunate for the fame of even Milton that he did not execute his design of writing a second Macbeth. When the curate purged Don Quixote's library with fire, he spared three romances. Toronto the White, for its quaintness. Palmering of England, partly for its merit, and partly because by some unaccountable blunder he fancied that it was written by a king of Portugal. Amadis of Gaul, because it was the first of the kind and the best. The censure of Cervantes was more efficient than his praise. Lobeira, like Ariosto, would have received no injury from his ridicule, if, like Ariosto, he had stood alone. But the old judgment was reversed. The proscription acted like the laws of Trajan in the East, and the father suffered for the faults of his worthless children. Montalvo and his imitators shelter themselves under a great name. The Sergas of Esplandian is called the fifth book of Amadis of Gaul. The histories of Esplandian's son and his son's son were the sixth, seventh, and eighth, 
and thus they went on from generation to generation. Fortes creantur fortibus might be their standing motto. Instead of concluding, chronicle-like, with he died and his son reigned in his stead, they keep Amadis alive like a patriarch or an adept. The father of a flock sees not so many generations sprung from him. To such longevity do they prolong his life, that instead of fixing his birth not many years after the crucifixion, it should have been dated some time before the flood. This perpetual succession of heroes was ill-imagined. The son was always to exceed the father, and in his turn yield to the grandson. As our hosiers, besides the best stockings, sell the extra best and the best superfine. Esplondian must fight with Amadis, and Lisuarte of Greece with Esplondian, and Amadis of Greece with Lisuarte. Hence also the ridiculous hyperboles. When all the varieties of fighting had been exhausted by Amadis, it only remained to make taller giants for Esplondian, and give a stronger scythe sweep to his sword, to mow them down. The fictions of Lobeda are more modest. Famangomadan and his family are but giants of the O'Brien breed, with names, to the great merit of their godfathers, of a most giantly proportion. If the author of Amadis be compared in his battles with Ariosto, his descriptions will be found as lively and as varied. He brings everything before the eye with the same poet's power, but he rarely or never so wantonly abuses his prerogative. In one respect, the after-romances copy the original with undeviating servility. They all have their Amadis and their Galaor, the constant and the general lover. There is at least some morality in the preference, but all the first-born are illegitimate. The hero must be every way irresistible. The loves of King Perion and of his son are justified or palliated by a pledged promise which the Catholic Church considers binding. Lobeda expressly says they were not without fault because the promise had been so secret. Montalva's morals are more casuistical and convenient. It is glory enough for me, says Urganda, when she gives the bastard sons of Galaor and King Sildadan as comrades to Esplandian. It is glory enough for me, since I can have no children myself, that these, by my means, have been born of others. For they shall do such things for the service of God, that not only will they be forgiven who begot them against the command of the Holy Church, and I who was the cause, but it will be imputed to them as so great a merit, that they shall thereby obtain rest for their bodies in this world, and for their souls in the next. Book 4, volume 270. Montalbo and his followers have totally changed the machinery. The Urganda, who appears to Galbanes and the Child of the Sea, is a true fairy, like Morgane Le Fay and the Lady of the Lake. Arcalaos is but a poor enchanter. He has only a room in his castle protected by a spell. His courage is more formidable than his black art. It is the fleetness of his horse that preserves him, not his magic. But the Urganda, who sails about in the great serpent, is an enchantress of a different species, and her rivals, the Irfeo and Melia, are as tremendous as the Medea of classical romance. The difference of religious temper is remarkable. Vasco Lobeira, who had never borne arms against any but the Castilians, made his hero fight with Christian enemies, and only now and then kill a stray pagan. In Montalvo's days, the reign of persecution had begun. The expulsion or extirpation of the Moors was a favorite hope of the Spaniards, after they had subdued them, and the heroes of Spanish romance naturally became the champions of the faith. It is no wonder that the original work differs so materially from the swarm of imitations. Tressan need not have supposed that they must have been written in a different country to account for its superiority. Lobeda could paint heroes from the life. The fame of the black prince and the odor of his virtues were still fresh in Spain. It was the age of chivalry, the noonday of heroism and honor. A Portuguese, 
one of the good and loyal Portuguese, as their own excellent chronicler calls them, who fought at Aljubarrota for King Joam of good memory, might conceive the character of Amadis. Nuno Álvares Pereira might be his living pattern. But a Spaniard, who described humane and generous valor in the days of Ferdinand and the Austrian family, could paint only from a dim recollection of the past. A century, the most eventful of any in human history, had changed everything. The mode of warfare, the politics, the religious feelings of Europe were all altered. The Inquisition and the House of Austria, two curses more fatal than all the plagues of Egypt, were established in Spain, and her civil and religious liberties were destroyed. Inferior as these afterbooks of Amadis certainly are, they form so singular an epoch in the history of literature that an abridgment of the whole series into our language is to be desired. Should this be attempted, it must be from the Spanish, not from the Bibliothèque de Romain, nor from the versions of Derberet. Derberet has omitted much that is curious in manners, and inserted much that is abominable in morals. He is inaccurate and obscene. There is occasionally, though but rarely, a rude and savage nakedness in the original which I have veiled. The Frenchman has always delighted to expose it. He has dilated single phrases into whole paragraphs with that love of lewdness which is so peculiarly and characteristically the disgrace of French literature. What has become of these books which were once so numerous? In their own country they are as rare as they are in this. Almost one might suppose that the curate and the barber had extended their inquisitorial scrutiny to the booksellers' shops and committed editions instead of volumes to the flames. It is the hypothesis of Wharton that romance was introduced by the Moors into Spain and from thence diffused over Europe. Writers of equal eminence have controverted this opinion and advanced others equally hypothetical. Romance, or fictitious narrative, is in fact, like poetry, common to all countries, and its character is in like manner everywhere modified by the circumstances of society. The machinery of the early romance writers is probably rather of classical than of oriental origin. Classical superstitions lingered long after the triumph of Christianity. The Spanish chronicles continually speak of augury. Certain practices of hidden faith were prohibited in Portugal by a law enacted during the life of Vasco Lobeira. The fathers of the church expressly assert that the gods of the Gentiles are the fallen angels, and with this key a Catholic may believe the whole of Ovid's metamorphosis. St. Anthony the Great saw and conversed with a centaur, and St. Jerome vouches for his veracity. Enchanted weapons may be traced to the workshop of Vulcan as easily as to the dwarves of Scandinavia. The tales of dragons may be originally oriental, but the adventures of Jason and Hercules were popular tales in Europe long before the supposed migration of Odin or the birth of Mohammed. If magical rings were invented in Asia, it was Herodotus who introduced the fashion into Europe. The fairies and ladies of the lake bear a closer resemblance to the nymphs and naiads of Rome and Greece than to the fairies of the East. The reputation of the books of chivalry was declining when Cervantes destroyed it. George of Montemayor had newly introduced the pastoral romance. His Diana is so dull and worthless a story that it is wonderful it should ever have been successful enough to provoke imitation. Tales of intrigue were becoming fashionable. Of these, Juan de Timoneda, a Valencian, is said to have been the first writer in Spain. His first work, El Patranuelo, bears date 1576. These novellas were symptomatic of worse morals than the books of chivalry. The comic romance, of which the heroes are uniformly rogues, was still more mischievous. Lazarillo de Tormes was the first of this class. Of the swarm which followed, Guzman de Alfarache and La Picara Justina are the best known. 
the common ballads of the country were infected and ruffians and sharpers are still the heroes of the popular songs of spain the french romances do not appear to have been naturalized either in spain or portugal of late indeed we are told by fisher that two editions of cassandra have sold in the space of a year and a half at madrid it is singular that calperenade should have found no readers in spain till he was no longer read in any other part of europe the books of chivalry have become scarce in consequence of their popularity they have probably been fairly worn out by repeated perusal but as their fashion was gone by it was useless to reprint them for general sale some few are still published for children and it is no little proof of their merit that they are their favorite books in england we have valentine and orson and the seven champions of christendom parismus and parismenus which is among the boys books mentioned by uncle toby and in the very interesting memoirs of mr gifford has lost its ground in portugal turpin's history of charlemagne and the twelve peers is the popular work the parent of the whole stock is the last survivor it remains that i should state in what manner the present version has been executed to have translated a closely printed folio would have been absurd i have reduced it to about half its length by abridging the words not the story by curtailing the dialogue avoiding all recapitulations of the past action consolidating many of those single blows which have no reference to armorial anatomy and passing over the occasional moralizings of the author there is no vanity in saying that this has improved the book for what long work may not be improved by compression eager wine may be distilled into alcohol the minutest traits of manners have been preserved and not an incident of the narrative omitted i have merely reduced the picture every part is preserved and in the same proportions amadis of gaul is valuable not only for its intrinsic merit as a fiction but as a faithful representation of manners and morality and as such these volumes may be referred to as confidently as the original the edition which i have made use of is that of seville fifteen forty seven the copy for the book itself is exceedingly rare was from the library of mr heber a gentleman whose liberality in the disposal of a very valuable collection leaves his friends less reason to regret that the public libraries of england should be more difficult of access and consequently less useful than those of any other country in europe the comte de tressan in his free translation has completely modernized and naturalized the character of the romance his book is what he designed to make it an elegant work but the manners and feelings of the days of chivalry are not to be found there they are all hidden under a varnish of french sentiment he has scoured the old shield the glitter which it has gained does not compensate for the loss of its sharpness nor for the lines that are effaced i should have abridged from the english translation had it been accurate that the character of the language might have assimilated better with the work but the english version which bears date as late as sixteen eighteen a century after the publication of the book in spain has been made from the french every trait of manners which were foreign to derberet or obsolete in his time is accordingly omitted and all the foolish anachronisms and abominable obscenities of the frenchman are retained i kept my eye upon it as i proceeded for the purpose of preserving its language where it was possible a modern style would have altered the character of the book as far as was in my power i have avoided that fault not by intermixing obsolete words but by rendering the original structure of sentence as literally as was convenient and by rejecting modern phraseology and forms of period it cannot be supposed that i have uniformly succeeded in this attempt the old wine must taste of the new cask the names which have a meaning in the original have not been translated i have used beltenebros instead of the beautiful darkling or the fair forlorn florestan instead of forester el patin 
instead of the Emperor Gosling, as we speak of Barbarossa, not Red Beard, Boca Negra, not Black Muzzle, St. Peter, not Stone the Apostle. The praise of accuracy is all to which I lay claim for the present work, and that I claim confidently. Perhaps others may not see the beauties which I perceive. The necessity of dwelling upon every sentence has produced in me a love for the whole. The reader will pass rapidly where I have lingered and loitered. He who drives post through a country sees not the same beauties as the foot traveller. But the merit of the work itself is not now to be ascertained. The verdict of ages has decided that. Amadis of Gaul is among prose what Orlando Furioso is among metrical romances. Not the oldest of its kind, but the best. End of Preface